Well, I don't see the point in waiting any longer. So let's bring her out. The star attraction, the one you came to see. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Ms. Judy Gold. Your mother died of lung cancer. But before she died of lung cancer, your father started, uh, who was a, a very, I love this story. He was a very well-respected professor and journalist and, mm -hmm. and, and had, had a massive effect on his students. And the reason I really relate to this is your father started falling and just losing some of his faculties. Uh, and you went to Dr. Oliver Sachs. Yes. And he had a cerebellum atrophy. Exactly. My mother had the same exact thing. And that's what she died from. And she start, it started in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And we went to every doctor. She would fall. She would get dizzy. She would slur her speech. And I took her. We went to the Mayo Clinic. I every neurologist. And you know, it's also oh, she's hysterical. And finally, a doctor said your cerebellum is atrophying, and it was at a slow rate. Mm -hmm. And they said it could have been. And some people get it at a fast rate, but she was at a very slow rate. They said it could have been caused by a fever she had when she was two years old. Like they don't know. They don't know. But when I read that, I was blown away. I'm actually getting chills because it wasn't. It didn't really have a specific diagnosis. So Same. You know, this is. Um, it, it's so rare, and for my dad, it was a very long. Same. Run. So painful because he was completely cognizant of, of what was going on. And Same. Sometimes it was his articulation because it was yeah. the muscles, but his brain was always intact. So for you know a professor and a public speaker not to be able to speak, right, was horrifying. Yeah, and, and uh, the falling and the dizziness and the fact that everyone was like, well, it could be this, it could be vertigo, it could be you know, and it was all these other things. And finally, when we found out, and then I read that, and I thought. Oh my God, I can't believe someone else went through this because you know, the, my mother was also that way. Very well read, very new knowing. Every, and to, to see the, I remember looking in her eyes and I, the fear because the falling and you write about this too. Falling is a huge thing for older people. And after your first big fall, I feel like everything changes. It, it, it does. You know, and there are two there are two things about that I'd love to just talk about. So, so the three of us, the kids, you know, we worked so hard to not tread on his independence, right? And yet to try to be helpful. And you know, we even talked to his shrink about ways to do that and ways not to. Um, and we, we, you know, and so we kind of like would finally get him to agree to put in a grab bar in, in the bathroom. And then the next day he would have it taken out. Right. Uh, so it was, it was this battle that um, was hard for everyone. And I think in the end, we all lost because we, we actually couldn't, um, we couldn't get to the right place. Right. It was, it was terrible. But on the, on the plus side, he retired from NYU probably in his early 70s. And and then when he started getting sick, we had all these health aides and and his, we didn't call him professor, but one of these aides started calling yeah. Professor Petro. Yeah. And the, the most stubborn man on the planet, you'd call him Professor Petro and he'd be like, what do you want me to do? I'll take those right. medicines. I'll clean this up. I'll do that. And, you know, the lesson there was, there was such implicit respect by kind of restoring him you know, to this to this title that right that, that, that so was his identity yeah his identity and that's so true for many men and then and then when they were both gone we were working on their grave markers and first we thought they had to be kind of like parallel in sentiment and for our mother we wrote like beloved mother and grandmother right and we went, we're trying to do something like that for my dad but we wound up with professor and journalist because that's who he was right I and, love that I love that story. Um, cause yeah, of course I dealt with the million home health aides, but in, you know, yeah. you also talk about, you know, humor. I mean, my mother would always be like right now she used it, you know, whenever we, 
I started talking about something like that. She was like, like, I'm, I'm doing this gig for the gays and the gays and the trans and the gays. And she goes, Judith, right now I'm so dizzy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we used to just make fun of her, you know, and you talk about that, about how important that, which is what I loved so much, laughter and humor. You talk about um, my friend, Lori Kilmartin, who, who tweeted about her father dying and how important it is to laugh. How important it is to laugh. And also so many of these topics, we don't want to talk about them. Right. We want to feel them. So I tried to bring in, I mean, these were real life stories of humor. Right. It's a way to open the door. It's a way to sort of take down the temperature. And, you know, so I talked about them having the grave markers. Well, there was 10 years before we were in the cemetery in Sag Harbor. My mom had canceled that trip like four times. I have to go to the hairdresser. I have right. to go to manicure, anything but here. We're finally out there in the winter. My dad, he goes and wanders off like he always did. And then he comes back and he said, I'm in Clay Felker, the founder of New York Magazine. Right. Down here. It's a good neighborhood. Then my mom is like, if I say yes, can I get a gin and tonic right now? And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we found our way through that. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of, a, you know, we bought six plots because they were cheaper by the half dozen. And, you know, right. you know it's like I wrote, you know, it's the cheapest real estate in the Hamptons. Uh, <laughs> um, hard things to talk about. Your father left a book called Very Short Fictions, mm -hmm. which you sort of finished. Right. Did, would you think you finished or edited or and they weren't fictions? They were not fictions. I, I no. He wrote the book, entire book himself. I have used some of that book in in my book. And, right. Um, um, and it was uh, it was it's it was a dark book. Um, yeah. You know, we talked a little bit. That's where he wrote about his relationship with me as as a guest. Right. But he also talked about how at NYU he was considered dead wood, an old tree at a certain point, and he also had many disappointments about his life. Right. He was very open about them under the under the guise of fiction. I think maybe he and I, this is another way that I'm the same, we're better at expressing our emotions on the printed page. Right, right. Than, you know, openly like this. Although right. you're so good as a doctor here. Um, I, I'm a really good doctor, Dr. Judy. I have no barriers. Um, <laughs> I love it. So <laughs> you're gonna have transference, Judy. I'm gonna be in love with you by the end of our talk. Oh good. Yes. As long as you're cut and you have a medium ball, I'm fine. Okay. Thank um, you for reminding everyone. I, <laughs> you have to, for all of my listeners, you have to tell the scone story. Oh, the scone story. Uh, this is, I, I love this story. So, um, do you know what? I've been on this tour for a while now. No one has asked me about the scone story. Thank well, you. You're on a Judy Gold podcast. It's my favorite. It's my favorite story. I, I, it's my. I love that story. Okay, go. So I am at a bakery, known for its scones, and there's a long line, and I'm watching those scones disappear one by one by one, and I'm like, I'm praying that I get to the line, to the head of the line, so that I get a scone. And the line's behind me, and there's some guy behind me, and. Finally, it's my turn. And I said, Well, didn't a woman, no, the woman in front of you, there was one left and she didn't, she ordered a croissant, right? Right. right. She, you know, so there I'm like melting down. You, know, you she's, think uh, she's going to get the, the woman in front of you, you think she's going to get the last going and you're like, oh, please don't, please don't. I've been waiting 25 minutes and, I'm and thinking, she orders a croissant. That's my scone. Then it's my turn. The scone is there. I order it. And this stranger just like, shouts out, no, that's my scone. I've been waiting online forever. And I'm like, so I turn around. And you're in front of him. I'm in front of him. So whatever his definition of forever is, it's plus something on mine. Right. So as you know, I grew up in New York. My instinct normally would have been like, fuck you, that's mine. Yeah, yeah you know, go fuck that's yourself. I drove you here. Fuck. Right. Something came over me and I just said to him, would you like half? And he's like, well, I'll buy something else and share that with you. And he did, and I did, and we but went Was out. he shocked when he you said shocked. that? He was shocked, but I was shocked. Right. By myself. Um, right. And. He bought some, what did he buy? I think he bought a croissant. Okay. No, that was all that was left at that point. 
But we did. And then we went outside and we talked for about an hour. We had nothing in common, but we found like this common ground through literally breaking, breaking croissants and scones in half. And it was a really telling moment. And it was the other part of it was I kind of overrode my instinct, which was to be snarky and territorial. Right. And that little bit of kindness made him a little bit kinder. And then since then, I've read like all these studies that kindness is like a virus also. If I'm nice to you, you're going to be nice to Laura. Right. You're going to be nice to somebody else. And it, you pass it along, just like all the bullying and meanness that gets passed along when somebody right. somebody. So um, there was somebody- That's so, It's so right. funny because there's so many times lately, which I want to talk about, the disease of the nastiness mm -hmm. uh, that we've had for the last four years, where- People are like armed and ready to go. And if you just simply like, I, I was at the stop and shit, stop and shop. And I had a shitload of groceries and I saw behind and I was waiting and waiting. And I saw the woman behind me had like two things of muffins mm -hmm. and a thing of, or two things of cookies and like a, mu a muffin. And I, and she was looking and I was putting all my stuff on the thing. And I go, do you want to go ahead of me? Mm -hmm. And it was like, I knew she was thinking, fuck shit, what? you know, and I, it, it made her day. It made her day. And Elisa, my lover was like, you let her go ahead of you. And I go, yeah, she has two things, three things. And it made my day. Exactly. We get so much back by being nice. Right. I mean, everybody should try it. <laughs> Okay, these are things I really want to discuss. Dealing with divisiveness. Now, I have a relative, a close relative, who is a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. as is her husband. Mm -hmm. And it is, I, we basically, it's so fraught with walking on eggshells and waiting, you know. So we don't, we try not to mm -hmm. um, get into it. But it's always looming. Right. And it's like, because the other person is waiting for an in to go, you know what I mean? Like, we'll all be together and uh, no politics, but mm -hmm. it's, it's an eggshell walk. It's like, and anything can be an in. Like, you, I'm completely avoiding it, but I know she mm -hmm. is ready for like, and it's for, even for me to say, Oh, throw the recycling over there. That's an in. You know right. what I mean? Yes. Like any little, oh my God, it's unusually hot today. You know, whatever. Um, you're your proponent, uh, you're against, you know, climate change. Right, right. <laughs> but it, it'll be anything. It'll be anything. Just, and you say that if you are at someone's house for a dinner party or mm -hmm. the host is the boss and sets the rules. Yes. And Sarcasm and snark are no nos. Now, as a lesbian, yes, and a Jew, I mean, I can't, with the sarcasm, I can't live without. And you're a gay; you have to be snarky. So, what do you mean by the sarcasm and snark are no nos? Only it, it, like you can be your personality. You can. So, I'm really glad you and I are having this conversation because we are the same way in this right. Group. You know, we have an outward persona. We use words. We use our personality, sometimes in an acute way. Right. We're, we're not mean people. Right. That's what I'm talking about. You right. don't want the mean to be what's, what's driving what's going on. You can be funny. You know, you can be snarky, but not... Right. Mean. And, you know, it's, it's obviously an advanced... You need an advanced degree in this. Right. But it's, it is someone, you know, the host is in charge. And I'm just like, I've been talking about... It recently with vaccine and vaccine etiquette. Right. Ugh. If you have people over to your house, you set the rules. Right. You no, know, you need to be vaccinated. You need to stay 1,200 feet away from me, whatever right. it is. Right. You know, and you want to, you know, you want to make people comfortable. And sometimes that means they don't even get to come. Right. But yeah. It's funny because the other night for my show here in Provincetown, uh, two women were going to get tickets and, and uh, they said, well, you, can, you need to show your vaccination card and you have to wear a mask. And they're like, fuck that. I don't know why I hit the bell. You fuck that. 
uh, you know, she could have had two people, but because you're blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't want you there. I don't, I'd rather not sell the tickets to someone who believes that, you know, it's what I find fascinating is, you know, comedians are getting canceled because someone doesn't like their joke, you know, which is just to make you laugh. If you don't like it, move on with your life, you know? And yet I read, there's articles in the paper about how to speak to anti-vaxxers. No, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't have to, you're an asshole. That is how to speak it. You are a fucking selfish asshole. And okay. so I yeah. would, I would disagree with you here. Okay. In that, um, you know, everybody who doesn't, who's not vaccinated is not an anti-vaxxer. Well, no, I know that. I'm talking yeah, about the ones yeah, who be are. Careful not dumping everyone into that. Yes, into that people problem. with immune problems, I am not talking about you. People who, until recently who were pregnant, you know, it wasn't right, right. People from the black community have right. limited reasons to be suspicious. So yes, I, I agree with all of those. But then, you know, when you get to like just the the holdouts, yeah, then you have, um, I mean, I had a painter at my house this week. He was telling me that Nancy Pelosi went to China in 2019 and she brought the virus back in her Louis Vuitton purse. I'm oh like, my God, I can't take it. It was like, who would ever ruin a Louis Vuitton purse? Not <laughs> Get a grip. I mean, that's that, that has to be a conspiracy. Well, I mean, he did a good paint job if he did that room. He did a nice work. Yeah, he did a very, he very, did a All very. Right. Well, he's an idiot. Okay. Age appropriate clothing. Mm-hmm. So um I I talk about my my mom with that a lot. So she was always a very um well-dressed, well put together woman. And right. she liked to show it off. Right. And, and how old are you? I'm fifteen, fifty-eight, fifty-eight. <laughs> I'm sixty-four. And you know, in our community especially. You kind of get over, I don't know, is it 40 or 50? You start to become invisible. Right. Yeah, you know, it's all about- Well, for a woman, you know, it's like 35. Okay, right. go ahead. So I talk about, you know, we need to stay visible. And part of how we stay visible is our appearance. You know? Right. You know, and that, so my mom wore like Gucci and Gucci underwear until she passed. And, um, but it was also just a way with, with color and sense of self to say, I am here, pay attention to me. And not it's, in a narcissistic yeah. way. Yeah, like it's I not would totally narcissistic. Right. I would buy like I would buy really I love sneakers and <laughs> I have now made this decision. I am not I am not gonna be uncomfortable anymore by wearing shoes that I don't that are fashionable, but no, I'm not doing it. So I have really cool sneakers. And sometimes my sons are like, Mommy, you can't wear that. My friends wear that. And I'm like, too bad. Ooh. Too bad. No, and my ex-husband, I, I, you know, I used to wear, I do wear short crop blazers and, and yeah. my jeans. And he was like, that's so inappropriate for your age. And I'm like, he was my no. age. Like, right. Old man, old man, you know, everything's falling off you. Don't right. Talk about that. I'm so glad you got divorced from him. I hate him now. Me too. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is one thing I really loved that you wrote about. Uh, or, or I might have, I've done so much research, so I could have just heard of this. Okay. That's just I might think be- this might be an article you wrote. Okay. The importance of names. I am always like, someone tells me their name. I'm like, okay, okay, Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. Like I notice, even when I'm doing a, you know, a TV show or, or and I meet someone on the crew or a PA who, who and saying their name, is like a validation. And so I just was working, I was just in Atlanta, mm-hmm. my friend, my friend who knows who she is. Uh, she, knows, she knows her name. Her she knows name. who she is. Cause this is, was our, we met on the set and we became really good friends. And she's kept saying, do you want to do that, hun? What hun? And, and she would say it and it really made me crazy. And it's like, don't call me hun, call me Judy. But it, it wasn't just that she was calling me hun. Like she, first it was just me. And then I realized she does it to everyone. And it, it was very off-putting. You know, our names are our are, are identifiers. Right. We are not visible. We are not recognized when people are calling us hun or this or that or the wrong, the wrong name. Right. And that applies even more, you know, if you're talking about someone who's trans. 
Right. You know, I love this Caitlyn Jenner. Tell the Caitlyn Jenner story. Yeah. <laughs> so that's from my that is from my TED talk. And yeah. uh, so I was at this dinner party pre-COVID, you know, around the time Caitlyn was transitioning. And we got, we kind of got into it. And my friend, the host, was like, don't tell me to call her Caitlyn and not this, and to use this pronoun and not that. You know, you're trying to, you know, you're politically correct and so on and so forth. And I said, look. That is the name that she wants to go by. You got married a little while ago and you changed your name and we all call you now so-and-so last name. You know, it's right. thing. It's about respect. You know, you didn't make me do it. I did right. it because that's who you are now. And she didn't, she didn't get it at the time. Oh. A couple of years later, she did. But, uh, right. you know, it, I think, it, it, but it's, it's very, it, it's frustrating because that is so much about our identities and we want to be, we want to be visible. We want to be respected. Right. You say civility is an obsolete word and that we are now confusing the right. You write about, or you talk about the right Mm -hmm. and the left. The right is confusing politeness with being woke. Right. And so, you know, if we go back to the beginning of this conversation, you know, we have stationary from our mothers right. writing thank you notes. That is nice. That is that is polite. That's kind of though the patina or the dressing of what it means to actually respect somebody, listen to somebody. And that part we're deficient in. But we have right. like we we think that civility means good manners. Like I know how to, I know which fork to use. Right. Civility, when you go back to, you know, sort of the Latin and the French, it means thinking about we and not me. Right. Community, and not my family. The larger sense of, um, you know, sort of what we're doing here. And right. So that's, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about, about civility and, and versus, you know, sort of being nice, being well-mannered. Right. Uh, you know, and in the South, people are very well-mannered. They've been that way for centuries. You know, and it's the home of slavery. You could be a very nice- right. I always like. I don't trust that with the okay. And I'm thinking, what did your great grandfathers do? like? It's so horrible that I think that it's so. That, the word that comes to mind is dichotomous, which is right. Like the word, but, right? Um, it doesn't. It you know, it just doesn't make sense. It's and so, yeah. And um, so we need to be authentic in in our relationships too. Right. Which well, I, mean, I, if I, if I'm anything, it is authentic. But by that, I mean, engage, disagree, but don't make it personal. Don't say, you know, you know, what people even said, like about Melania Trump, I was reading today, you know, how, how, you know, what she looked like. That's not the point. Right. You got to speak. It really isn't. That, that jacket she wore. That's the point. That's the point. And, um. You know, Judy, one of the things I learned from doing this book, and it, I learned this from readers, so many of the topics are hard. And by becoming open and vulnerable, it allowed it allowed me and my family to talk more about them. Right. And there were there were two times when my mom said, What's gonna happen when I die? Right. And the first two times I came back and I said, Mom, what do you want for dinner tonight? I could not deal with it. Right. Um, the third time when she said it. I realized I have to step in. I have to right. become into this conversation and, and go with it. And I think there's a metaphor there. If we can make ourselves vulnerable with people that we know and care about, we can find more connection and we right. can go. And so right. it's kind of a larger takeaway from this. And we get past the labels. Right. Because um, you, you can't avoid this, th- talking about stuff like this. Christine Blasey Ford, you talked about, it was an article the Washington Post. Post, right. right. And, um, you know, so this was during the confirmation hearings. For yeah. Kavanaugh, and she was constantly referred to as like the other woman. Right. She wasn't, the headlines did not even use her name. Right. And this is about, I, I think that, and I think the headline of that, that column was call her by her name. Right. You know, and gets back to what we're talking about. And right. Women are often um, diminished in that way. Gays can be, and um, you know, we need to say Christine Blasey Ford, right? And and the truth. Yes, you I know. can't stand. Can you believe what they did, the SCOTUS? Like, I can't. I I can't even. I'm so upset it's about it. Thing. I mean, the earlier thing this month, the Texas. Yeah, the, I, I just I can't believe. I mean, thank God my mother's dead because that generation of women 
what they went through, it's ridiculous. Like your mother would be freaking out, don't you think? So my mother's second to last words were, give money to Planned Parenthood. No way. I love your mother. Her very last words were, I want to divorce your father. (laughs) No way. (laughs) And she had to read it. And I said, Mom, it's too late. (laughs) But we'll give the Planned Parenthood. And that was a obituary. Oh my God, that's fucking hilarious. I am fascinated by you. And I want to know what, I mean, you're so aware, right, of all this stuff. Do you ever just say, all right, you know what? I'm not even going to think about that slob or the way that person's speaking. Do you ever, like the other night I had friends over, I made this big lasagna, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and I always, I cook. And so I always invite people over and then I get annoyed because they don't act the way I want them. So that I said, I will make this, you know, lasagna. Can you bring mm-hmm. a salad? They bring a salad, no salad dressing, right? And What's it's like, that? oh, sorry, I didn't know you wanted to. How, how would you not know? So I have to make some salad dressing because I, I hate store-bought salad dressing. So I got annoyed at that. Mm-hmm. And then I gave them all real, and I made garlic bread and all this stuff. And I gave them, I Gave everyone a big piece of lasagna, Mm -hmm. garlic bread. I made the salad dressing. And then one of the guests is like, gets up from the table. And I go, what are you doing? She's like, in the middle of dinner? Well, yeah, we're all sitting eating. Um, And she gets up with her plate. She's like, I'm going to go get another piece. It's like, A, you're not getting another piece. I'm getting the piece for you. And I said, I'll get it. But, and then I was like, ugh, because I gave them such big pieces because I yeah. wanted leftovers. Right. And I said, so I will get it for you, but I really want, I didn't really want you to have a second. I told her that. Now, I've lost. I know that was wrong. The this story, but. But. <laughs> but you know what it reminds me of? You remember the old Mary Tyler Moore show and Lou is at the Christmas dinner and she has- God rest pieces. your soul, Ed Asner, yeah. Yeah. He has six pieces of veal Prince Orlov. Right. And he takes three. Right. Says, Mr. Grant, I only have six. Right. Six. No, it, people do not, they don't think enough sometimes. Right. And it's like, they all are mad at me. They're like, oh, are you going to be yelling about this and yelling? And I'm like, it's just annoying. Like, don't get up from the table. I'm serving. And then I was giving her the piece. She goes, can I have that a little more pasta part? I was like, shut up. Take what you get and shut the fuck up. And my mother also had this rule. If it's not on the table, don't ask. Is that true? Yes, that is true. And, oh, fuck. You know, your other point, which is about how what you and I do. Right. People are afraid they're going to wind up, I'm sure, in your act. Right, right, right. Homes. And, um, you know, and I was having a sort of a heated conversation with a friend last night, and she said in the middle of it, I don't want you writing about this. Right. <laughs> and I wanted to say, too late, you're in the middle. Yeah, yeah, right. No, it's I, true. But do you ever just stop and just go, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't. I, I, you know, I do go off duty. You do? I do. Um, you know, I need to recharge. And right. I need to sort of, you know, let, let go. I'm always with my notebook. And did you know my friend Bob Smith? Because you remind me of him so much. I know of Bob Smith, but I did not. I oh, he was my best friend. Uh, you guys would have loved each other. Well, uh, I'm single still. He's dead. He died. I know. I'm not. I, for, I'm just saying in. Oh, right. To people who are alive, I'm saying. Right, single. yes. And he has one very nice ball that hasn't aged at all. At all. Um, it's plastic. Yeah, it's plastic and it's not drooping. Okay. First of all, everyone, please get this book, Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old. But also read read Stephen's other books and article. You're just, I love you. I could ha- I could talk to you all day. Now, I always ask my um, podcast guests two questions. Mm -hmm. One, we're very pro mental health. Mm -hmm. So what do you do for your mental health? 
I'm on antidepressants. I meditate. I practice the piano and I exercise. Well, I, um, it took me until four years ago to actually publicly acknowledge that I suffer from, from depression and anxiety, you know, a lot. It's the same thing. We're the same person. All right. And it was, it was, you know, and it it was, you know, I've written about having cancer, being misdiagnosed right. with AIDS, so on and so forth. It was, that was probably one of the hardest things I've, I've written about because I was still internalizing that stigma. Right. And, um, and just this week, I finished a column for the Washington Post, which talks about the language, again, we use around mental health. You know, and I'm talking about Simone Biles and what, what right. about um, um, Naomi Osaka. But people say to each other, it diminishes us. It, um, it's, it's so hurtful. So... You know, so I talk about it. I, I, um, I try when I'm sort of not able to be myself, not to lie anymore and to say, right. I can't be there because I'm not feeling well for mental right. health reasons, rather than lying and sort of putting it under the carpet again. Um, and that's, 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 that's Oh still- my God, I love that. You know, Stephen, I'm giving you my, my phone number because I have, when I have the days, you know what I'm talking about, where you're like, okay, I just, tomorrow's another, like, I just got to get through today. I just got to get through today. I, there are a few people I text. Um, so I'm giving you my number because I just, it's like, it's all, it's the people that know that it is, it is going to get better, but mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like it. And it's so hard, but I, I find that interesting that you find out recently about this when I had a bad clinical depression, mm-hmm. I, re- and it was bad. I was like out of commission, you know, yeah. I, it changed me drastically. Like that was definitely a before and after, but it also made me so cognizant of the fact that I had this disease my entire life, diurnal depression, mm-hmm. um, that the anxiety of waking up in the morning uh, you know, like I, it made me think back to the, because you recognize the feeling. You're like, oh, I had this feeling blank and I had this feeling then and I had this feeling. And I always say, I go on stage, I say I'm mentally ill and I'm proud of it, you know, but it is something we really ha- have to talk about as like, uh, you know, I have a cut in my arm, you know? Exactly. You know, we don't make fun of people. We don't diminish people who have cuts, cancer, right. whatever, but it comes to mental health. It's a, you know, it's a joke, you know, right. you can be mocked and um, it makes me so, it makes me so angry. Yeah, me too. Like, you know, cause the culture just keeps perpetuating. And the, the stuff with Naomi and Simone, and I already went, I went through this with my son. I hope he doesn't get mad that I, but he, he, um, he was a D1 athlete and mm-hmm. he is like, I, I can't feel like this anymore. And he's now playing division three right. um, and haven't heard him this happy in years, but that all this stuff that people opining about, Oh, she doesn't know how good she has it and blah, 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 blah. And they're not tough. And it, I want to kill them. I want to kill these people. Yeah. Tough you know? is not is not the answer right you know and self self understanding and self compassion is a the first part and then proper treatment i didn't get right I, the right treatment for a long time right and that was because you know i appeared high functioning and right so forth. you did too i'm sure and yeah um and but I now it. i feel like you know do you take meds i take meds yeah so i i feel like and I've tried to switch meds because I'm like, oh, I gain weight or this or that, or, oh, I can't have an orgasm, but I worked it out and with the doctor and yeah, it's like if I had diabetes, you know? Yeah. Well, I take a, I take a med for my depression. I take a med for cholesterol and it's- Yeah, I do too. Are you on a statin? I am. Rosuvastatin? <laughs> no, just plain old Lipitor. Oh, I think mine's the same thing, whatever. Okay. So that's number one. I love that. And number two is this is going to be hard for you. Oh, maybe it won't be. Um, I always, I call the podcast kill me now because I get annoyed at every, I like, I really do. Like there are things that drive me up a fucking wall. Like 
right now, what's really pissing me off is the chin diaper where they wear the mask mm -hmm. um, only over the mouth. And it's like, ooh, you're just a fucking, it's so passive aggressive. Like I can't like put it over your nose and don't act like you don't know that it's supposed to go over your nose or that it's not on your nose. Okay. So what, that's my kill me now for this week. What is, what pisses you off more than anything in the entire world? <laughs> um, so in a way this should be hard but it's right. really easy yeah i think it's so disgusting when people wear flip-flops on planes oh my god yes 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 I, yes yes I, you know, I do not want to see your feet i do not want you putting them up i want you wearing shoes and socks and um that's, you know what that's, Steven? Like, that kill me now that it you don't want to know something else it's dangerous because they say don't wear flip-flops on on planes in case you have to run off right. you can't run it i it drives me up a wall you know what else drives me up a wall? i'll get on a plane at 6 a.m yeah there'll be a woman full makeup skinny like a, a dress like with her vagina hanging out i'm mm -hmm. like what did you get up at two in the morning and have hair and makeup come over to your hat like who no or people who drink they're like, I'm on a 7 a.m. flight. And they're like, yeah, I'll have a, a vodka ton. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing today? Whatever. You're too funny. I'm hearing envy, though, in, in this set. <laughs> no, no, I can't. I can't with the makeup. But I also, the flip-flops drive me crazy. I just look at the feet like, what is wrong? You have no self-esteem. None. No. And God knows what diseases you're spreading. Yeah, exactly. Steven, I had so much fun. I love you. Can I come visit you? When are you going to be in New York or P-Town? you got to come to P-Town. Have you I, been here? I have. I love it. Yeah. Okay. You, are you there most of the time or is this just a... Well, I have been staying here most of the time, uh, which was my dream and goal of my life. And now, you know, the pandemic. Um, I came in March of 2020. I've been here most of the time I, and I love it. Well, you know, I love, um, I think it's called East End Books, Jeff. Yes. Peter. That, yes, we yes. Have get me, we have to get me to do a reading there. So that, Well, yeah, I love that. The guy's great. I did yeah. something there, but it was a pandemic, so I just had to go over and sign books and stuff. But we did something online. Yeah, he's great. So. Yeah. So where can people find you? Please buy this book. They can find me at stephenpetro.com. P-E-T-R-O-W. Yes, W at the end. And... um the book is available at uh, booksellers everywhere, including the behemoth, Amazon. Yes. And are, do you have links on your website? I do. To every, everything we talked about. Are you on social media? I am. And Stephen Petro for just about Twitter. Everything. And, and I really hate social media, which is next time we talk. We'll talk about that. I have a, a love-hate relationship with it. And it's driving me crazy. I wish I just liked writing and getting on stage at night, not having to like you know, for people like us, it's a useful platform and tool, but I have right. so many misgivings about it. Otherwise. Yes. Yes. Same. Um, Steven, thank you so much. I wish you only the best. I wish I could have met your parents. They would have only been. one. They would, have, um, they would have loved you. And I love you. Thank you. I was, oh, I love I was you. nervous beforehand. You know, Why? I you and I was like, <gasps> oh, no, this was the best. You're the best. I'm giving you my phone number. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to be, we're official friends right now. Good. And I, also, okay. I want your mailing address. Ah, I went to what's coming. Thank you so much. Until the next time. Thank you. Until the, yeah. And good luck with this. It's fucking great book. Thank you so much for listening to part two of Kill Me Now with the one and only Stephen Petro. I mean, how great is he? I love him. We're BFFs now. Kill Me Now is produced by Laura Vogel, edited by Colin Schmeling. Uh, the podcast would not be possible without the help of Brittany Joe Sowards. And you, you people, subscribe, leave a review. I say this every week, five stars. Please, I need some positive reinforcement. You know what I'm saying? Because I have a shitty... I have really, I can't believe I have a shitty rating on Uber. I'm really nice. I think people don't understand me. Anyway, uh, go to my website. You'll see all things Judy. I can't even go to it because I can't stand myself. But, you know, go. Also, on Sunday, 
Sunday, as my mother used to say, I will be in Minneapolis at the Pay Gap Festival at the Minnesota State Fair, Minnesota State Fairgrounds. I'm very excited. I love Minnesota and St. Paul, Minnesota. What else is going on? Vaxxed people are the best. Anti-vaxxers, go fuck yourself. Been wearing a mask, hating the subway um because people are just out of control but i do wear a mask and i take pictures of all the people not wearing a mask and i don't know what i'm gonna do with them but i'm gonna do something like an installation i can't believe you're still listening to me speak i love you all i really do appreciate your support of this podcast which um is a labor of love and is uh, costing me money (laughs) but i i just love it i love it i love don't tell anyone i said this but i do love people and I love talking to people even though I do hate everyone but um anyway follow me on tweetar instagram uh at judy gold j-e-w-d-y-g-o-l-d because I'm Jewish Jewish I hope all the Jews had a um easy fast last week and um are sealed in the book of life I'm already starting with my sins because you know I have a whole year so um everyone be well take care of yourself and as we always say so long And uh, everything was wonderful. I'll see you soon. Thank you for the visit. So long.